minutes after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchtone telephone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Sandeep Mahendra. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Infosys earnings call during the Q4 and FY20 earnings release. So, Sandeep from the Investor Relations team in Bangalore. Joining us today on this call is CEO and MD Mr. Sarel Parekh, CEO Mr. Praveen Rao, CEO Mr. Nilanjan Rao, along with other members of the team and management team. We'll start the call with some remarks on the performance of the company by Sarel, Praveen, and Nilanjan before opening up the call for questions. And we note that anything which we say which refers to our outlook for the future is a forward-looking statement, which must be read in conjunction with the risks that the company faces. A full statement and explanation of these risks is available in our filings with the SEC. It can be found on www.acc.gov. I would now like to pass it on to Salil. Uh, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, first, apologies for, uh, from us for starting this off late. Uh, good evening and good morning to everyone on the call. Uh, I trust each of you and your loved ones are safe uh, in these extremely different times. Uh, the financial year that just ended uh, ended very well for us. It was an exceptional year. We grew at 9.8% in constant currency, delivered 21.3% operating margin, grew our digital revenue by 38%, and for for it uh, for the digital revenue now in Q4 has become 42% of our overall business. We did this with $9 billion of large deals for the full year. Our earnings per share grew at 8.3% in dollar terms. We had, in fact, the highest cash collection for the quarter and for the full year in our history. In Q4 itself, we grew our business 6.4% year-on-year in constant currency and delivered 21.1% operating margin with $1.6 billion of large deals, some of which in the last two weeks of the quarter. We closed the year with an extremely strong cash position of $3.6 billion and no debt on our balance sheet. As the last two to three weeks of March saw, the impact of COVID was significant. We had already activated our business continuity plan with an intense focus on employee safety and client service delivery. Today, we have 93% of our employees working remotely a task that was performed with incredible efficiency and tremendous hard work by all of our teams. Praveen will share with you more color on this later in the call. In addition to that, we have added financial security of the company and absolute focus on liquidity and cash. We have now activated a comprehensive program for cost control and reduction. Lundin will share some preliminary highlights of this later in the call. We, of course, anticipate near-term challenges in the business environment across a whole set of industries. However, we see increased interest from our clients in cloud virtualization, workforce transformation, and cost reduction programs. Our discussions with clients indicate they would like to consolidate their work with a strong player like us with exceptional service delivery, agility to reach 93% remote working, and an extremely strong balance sheet. I think those trends will hold us in good stead in the medium term. Let me spend a few minutes to share with you what we are doing outside of work supporting our communities that we live and work in. Via our foundation, we have dedicated rupees 100 crores towards relief efforts, including half of it to the Prime Minister Cares Fund in India to help enhance hospital capacity, provide treatment, ventilators, testing kits, PPEs for frontline health workers. In the U.S., we've opened Pathfinders Online Institute, an online learning platform for teachers, school children, and their families, 
so they can access high quality computer science education from home for free. Coming back to business, given the uncertain environment with the global pandemic and client business being marred by volatility, we do not feel it will be appropriate for us to provide guidance for this financial year. As a result, we're suspending providing guidance on revenue growth and operating margin for financial year 21. Given our strong performance in the just concluded financial year and our strong cash position, we are pleased to announce our final dividend for the financial year at Rs. 950 per share, bringing the total dividend for the financial year to Rs. 1750 per share. I'm extremely grateful to our employees for the diligence through this stressful period and proud of the work they have delivered for our clients. While we are unsure about what lies immediately ahead, we have enormous strengths that we believe will help us navigate this period and emerge stronger from it. We have a sustained focus on client relevance and we are now repivoting our efforts in terms of what clients are looking for and we see good traction in that. Our ability to work with clients across the entire spectrum of their needs including accelerating their digital journey and extreme automation for cost efficiencies. A highly skilled workforce of 240,000 people passionately working towards making a client successful, uh, unparalleled delivery capabilities, a $3.6 billion in cash on a debt-free balance sheet which gives us ample liquidity. Uh, with that, I'll pause my comments and hand it over to you uh, Praveen, over to you. Thank you, Salil. Hello, everyone. Let me start by summarizing key aspects of our quarter four performance. Our operating parameters were steady during quarter four. On site offshore efforts mix remained stable sequentially, but improved by 110 bits over quarter four 19. Utilization dropped sequentially during the quarter to 83.5%, partly due to COVID-19 related supply constraints. Large deal wins were healthy at 1.65 billion for quarter four, with the share of new deals increasing to 56%. We won 12 large deals in quarter four, out of which four deals were in retail and energy utilities resources and services, and one deal each in financial services, communication, manufacturing, and high tech. Region wise, seven were from America and five were from Europe. Encouragingly, many of the large deal closures happened in the last two weeks of the quarter, despite the COVID 19 situation. Attrition on a standalone basis was slightly higher at 18.2%. However, voluntary attrition reduced further to 15.1% from 15.6% last quarter. Higher involuntary attrition during quarter four was mainly on account of separations that occur as a result of yearly performance reviews which closed in December. This is part of our focus on ensuring a high performance culture. Moving into FI20, we finished the year with a strong 9.8% constant currency growth in revenues despite the impact of COVID-19 let's slow down in March. Volume growth for the year was 8%. Five of our business segments, communication, energy utility resources and services, manufacturing, high-tech, and life sciences, recorded double-digit growth in FI20. Similarly, both of our largest regions, North America and Europe, clocked double-digit growth in constant currency. We had large deal TCV of more than 9 billion in FI20, which is 44% higher than in the previous year. Moving to the business segments, we see near term weakness across the board, especially in the area of discretionary spending. Plans are focused on ensuring safety of their employees and maintaining business continuity while at the same time conserving cash. This is bound to impact near term performance as they reprioritize and delay some projects 
and reduce volume. However, we see long-term opportunity as the focus on digital and core transformation gets accelerated. Financial services segment is seeing the impact from interest rate decline across the world, which has severely compressed the net interest margin. The banking sector is also expected to experience increase in loan losses in the near future, which will have impact on their profit. Insurers may also see increased pressure due to higher clients. Post-COVID-19, we expect a strong opportunity for cloud data services and creating new digital bank capabilities. Retail segment has been hit hard, especially non-grocery, apparel, lifestyle and fashion, logistics, etc. While on a sequential basis, we have seen positive performance in the last quarter, and there was a healthy level of lot deal wins from this segment, we expect significant pressure on spend for the segment in the coming quarters. The deal pipeline is strong, but the conversion rate is expected to slow down. Lot deal wins in communication segment has led to stellar performance in the last fiscal. While we expect relatively stable performance from the telecom players, the media and entertainment industry is seeing pressure due to stoppage of outdoor events and general squeeze in advertising spend. Spend on 5G rollout and B2B use cases of 5G may also get delayed as the industry players reassess capital allocation priorities. Energy utility resources and services vertical reported strong growth in the last year with many large deal wins across geographies. However, with low energy prices and demand and supply chain issues in other sub-segments, the performance is expected to be weak in the near term. Manufacturing segments recorded double-digit growth in the last year despite weaknesses in automotive segment and supply chain pressure due to trade wars. However, COVID-19 spread exacerbated by supply chain disruption has resulted in widespread closure of production facilities across the globe. Stoppage and probably reduced travel in the near future will also affect the aerospace industry in terms of order book and deliveries. Digital is growing strong with share of revenue reaching 41.9% at the end of quarter 4 FI20 from 33.8% in quarter 4 FI19. Growth in digital revenue in the last fiscal was 37.8% on constant currency. While the global pandemic is having wide, widely varied impacts on different industries, the demand for business reinvention around digital is universal and increasingly urgent. From building more flexible supply chains to supporting new models of employee experience to urgently enhancing e-commerce offerings, plans are being forced to accelerate their pace of change. Technology is essential to support that change. Automation and efficiency is essential to fund that change. And design and experience are essential to unlocking value from those changes. Plans continue to see the need for investment around digital transformation and need partners who can help them navigate this strategic and technological complexity they face. Infosys remains that critical and trusted partner now more than ever. In the last year, we have been rated as leader in 26 services related to capabilities around digital Pentagon by industry analysts, which is a testimony to our digital capabilities. Our VPN services had a standout year and crossed 1 billion revenues at industry-leading margins. Additionally, revenue per employee improved thanks to automation and be featured in multiple external awards. With that, I will hand over to Milanjan. So, and the 520 earnings call. I will start with a push overview of Q4 and a recap of FY20 before moving to how we are preparing to secure our future in these challenging times. Quarter 4 operating margins were 21.1% compared to 21.9% in quarter 3, a drop of 80 basis points. These included a 90 basis points margin headwind due to COVID-led utilization and RPC decline. There was an additional headwind of 40 basis points this quarter for H1 visas in the U.S. for the financial year 21 due to the change in the USCIS lottery approval process where the lottery were declared in the March quarter. In addition, we took a hit of receivable provision account of ECL and higher CSR for the quarter of 50 basis points. This was offset by the rupee depreciation of 2.1% against the dollar during the quarter, 
which help margins by another 50 basis points, and another 50 basis points of lower travel cost and other cost optimization measures. Our DSO dropped by four days to 69. Our 15 focus on collections was demonstrating an OCS of $684 million for the quarter, which is a year-on-year -year increase of 17.3%. Free cash flow grew 27% year-on-year to $593 million. Let me talk about full year FI20. Our operating margins were at 21.3% for FI20, within a guidance band of 21 to 23%. The 1.5% drop in operating margins over FI19 were largely due to compensation increases, higher visa costs, and lower realization, partly offset by our cost optimization measures, where we exceeded our 150 million target for the year. For FI20, operating cash flow grew 15.4% to 2.611 billion. Free cash grew 12.1% and crossed 2 billion for the first time. Driven by a robust cash generation and healthy cash balance of 3.6 billion, the board has recommended a final dividend of rupees 9.50 per share, which will result in a total dividend of rupees 17.5 for FI20, which is the same as FI19. Yield on cash balance was 7.06% in Q4, compared to 7.7% in Q3. Looking ahead, our yield in FI21 will be impacted further due to the declining interest rate regime in India. These are unprecedented times, and we're taking multiple measures to ensure execution excellence of our operations. First, liquidity and cash management is a top priority. This includes rigorous focus on working capital cycles, including collections, receivables, and any other block cash. Secondly, reduction in capex, barring any committed or non-discretionary spend. A debt-free balance sheet and a superior local currency credit rating of A3 from Moody's gives us an enormous advantage during these times. The second area of focus will be agility in operations. We will need to be extremely nimble, yet measured in our decision-making process to counter the uncertainty which the current situation presents. We will balance short-term margin pressures with long-term sustainability by making no regrets moves. A third big focus will be accelerated cost takeouts. While we have made enormous progress on this during the last few years, this is even more critical for FI21. We have embarked on a series of steps to address near-term margin pressures emanating from lower utilization due to supply and demand mismatches. These steps include deferring salary increases and promotion, delaying the hiring process and timelines, complete freeze on discretionary spending, we will also continue to look at the entire gamut of other cost levers we have as the situation evolves. Our ongoing strategic cost optimization levers around automation, pyramid rationalization, on-site offshore, subcontractors will of course continue as in the earlier years. We are confident that our proximity to our clients and our superior talent engine will enable us to weather this storm. With that, we can open up the call for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may please press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Thank you. First question is from the line of Ankur Rudra from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, the first question is, uh, Salil, if you understand the need to drop guidance this time, but based on your current visibility on demand, I know it's an exceptional year, and the order book and the conversations you've had, um, how should we think about uh, you know when you get back to normalcy uh, you know, in the sort of the rhythm you were in before, either in terms of the revenue profitability levels last seen in December or March, or how the shape of seasonality of revenues might turn out this year. Thanks. Well, hi, Ankur. Uh, um, what, what we are seeing today is uh, uh, overall there is no real clarity on when uh, things are going to be back uh, into uh, a situation where we have a clear view uh, to give a guidance. Uh, today, we definitely see in the short term uh, some concerns uh, 
uh, where uh, the business environment is uh, extremely difficult. However, uh, when we start to see uh, this uh, business environment starting to stabilize and we have visibility, uh, we'll be back with uh, uh, what we see in terms of guidance. We don't have a clear uh, uh, answer today whether this is uh, for X quarters or Y quarters. Uh, our sense is the first order effect, I think, is visible all around uh, in the sectors. Uh, Kevin shared uh, specific detail on them. Uh, there'll probably be some second order effect. And it also depends overall on how uh, the medical uh, situation evolves. So we are not uh, 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 commenting on, on the timeline here. What we are very clear is, and these are already discussions that uh, many of us uh, within the leadership have had with clients, there's a strong interest in consolidation with strong partners like us. There's a strong interest in looking at cloud move uh, movements uh, and making changes in virtualization. There's a strong interest in looking at uh, could there be some uh, captives that uh, could become more available. And all of those areas we're exploring. So in the medium term, given our strength in terms of delivery, our financial strength, uh, and the overall interest that clients have in consolidation, I feel positive. But in the near term, we see uh, some weakness going ahead. Uh, thanks for that, Salil. In the in the near term, uh, do you think there will be any changes to your capital return policy just to keep the prouder driver acquisitions or other movements you may have to make? So I'll take that. So I think our capital allocation is quite clear, linked link, link to our free cash flows. So I think, uh, like I said, we have enough of headroom, and we'll have to see if any uh, assets which come up which interest us during this period. Uh, but uh, we are open to everything at this stage. All right, thank you, and best of luck. Let's take the next question. Yeah, Mr. Rizzo, thank you. Uh, the next question is from the line of Sneed Patchman from Bank of Montreal. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you very much. I wanted to ask about any boundaries or any signposts that you could give us on your margins. So even if we stay away from revenue comments, uh, is there any any kind of minimums or floors you think the business could sustain even in the face of what is obviously incremental revenue pressure? Uh, and or you mentioned that there was 90 basis points of COVID impact in the um, in the current quarter. Is there any incremental COVID impact that we should be thinking about in the June quarter? But just some broader comments on um, just margin trends or boundaries or things to consider as we're looking at our models. Yeah. So the impact of COVID was largely about 30 odd million, 32 million. Two third of that was supply led, uh, which was as we were ramping up our enablement of work from home. Uh, and uh, about a third of that was demand-led, uh, partly from clients who have started now giving us approvals to work from home, and partly uh, because of some ramp down. So that was the equation for the last quarter. Uh, so that pretty much fell into uh, the quarter margin as well, like I mentioned, 90 odd basis points. Uh, as we're looking into this quarter, of course, initially we are making try to improve the work enablement. Uh, the figure of 93% of cost for the on-site is much, much higher and slightly lower in the offshore. So that's number one. So our first priority is to continue to improve our uh, supply side uh, of the equation so that we don't leave any money on the table. Uh, in terms of the Q1 near-term outlook without uh, looking at how much of you know revenue, et cetera, is going to happen, we've already made, started making the margin moves, like I said, which we call no regret moves. We've talked about the whole uh, moving out of the hiring uh, season, the fees on the uh, uh, promotions, the fees on the salary hike. So those are the things we've already uh, started off to. There will be pressure, yeah, as you know, that the entire industry in effect around the world did not, you know, uh, year up for a sudden stop. So the, you know, people hired, etc. As you close the quarter for, for a different set of volume, there will be natural attrition during the quarter as well, which will help us. But the first near-term impact, of course, is going to be on the utilization uh, uh, because of the supply-demand mismatch. 
but that will iron itself out uh, as the quarters progress. Uh, and we will continue, like I said, on our margin optimization strategic levers in terms of automation, in terms of the pyramid, uh, the on-site pyramid, which is uh, we are only the ones who are capable of doing that uh, because of our full stack uh, DCs in the uh, in the US context. Uh, our subcon costs, you know, uh, how do we replace them? So there are a number of levers which we will look at. Discretionary expenditure, uh, you know, that's completely, you know, uh, stopped now. Whether it's discretionary capex. So a number of levers, both from a margin, preservation of cash, making sure that our liquidity cycles continue to roll, uh, early warnings in terms of any stress on any clients in terms of uh, defaults. Uh, but like I said, you know, quarter four is anything to go by. We had a very strong collection quarter. Okay. My, my follow-up question then is um, I wanted to ask something that TCS mentioned last week in that they, the comment was that the financial crisis uh, was, at least from a growth perspective, a relevant benchmark. In other words, the first quarter of the financial crisis, uh, revenues dropped uh, plus or minus 10 percent. And I just wanted to know, is that an industry perspective that you would endorse? And what I mean by that is uh, just the sequential drop for industry-related revenues as investors think about the June quarter is the financial crisis when that first struck. Is that a relevant benchmark, or do you think this is uh, different from the financial crisis? Thanks very much. Hi, this is Tadeel. Uh, let me uh, try to address that point. Uh, I think um, our sense is uh, this uh, uh, situation is uh, uh, somewhat different from uh, what transpired uh, in the financial uh, crisis uh, from a few years ago, in that this is across all um, sectors and all geographies. Equally, uh, there's an incredible financial stimulus that uh, at least uh, the U.S. Uh, have put together and which uh, there's strong indication that several European um, uh, countries or certainly the European region uh, will join in. Uh, so th those are some distinctions that we see uh, between uh, uh, the actual uh, crisis from an economic perspective. Uh, with respect to how that impacts Q1, uh, it it's therefore not uh, a straightforward comparison. I think what is clear is there will be obviously um, some impact in Q1, uh, and then we'll have to see um, how this plays out because uh, there are counterbalancing forces. Uh, if, if the fiscal stimulus force uh, becomes more, more dominant versus uh, anything on, on the medical side, there's one set of outcomes. Uh, if, the, if the medical side has uh, sort of a second wave, uh, there's another set of uh, outcomes. Uh, and that's part of the reason why uh, we, we don't have a sense uh, of, uh, you know, w what, what is the sort of quarterly progression here. Uh, we are very focused on ensuring, as uh, the London shared, a very aggressive cost line. We're very focused uh, uh, in, in this view that Perrin shared. We have real operational capability to do it in the one, and we have extreme strength that we think will emerge with all of the consolidation in the medium term. Okay, thanks very much. That's it for me. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Divya Nagarajan from UBS. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, just to follow up to the previous couple of questions, uh, if you were to kind of look at the 2008-10 time frame, and I do get your point that it's not really apples to apples here. Uh, typically in downturns, we do see a fair amount of pricing pressure. Uh, could you kind of you know, give us your sense on how this could be the same or different to last time because they're clearly in a very strong technology cycle. What I'm trying to understand is that could that offset some of the typical pricing pressures that we see in uh, spending environments that are stressed? And let me start with that, and uh, we might have other points to add to it as well. Uh, on pricing, um, it is obviously depending on the industry of, of, our, of our clients, their segment, there will be different levels uh, of uh, cost stress uh, among them. Uh, equally, as you mentioned and Praveen shared earlier, 
uh, we have some real strengths that we see, for example, in telco, uh, in uh, high tech, uh, we see some strength uh, in um, life sciences, uh, in in the sort of consumer staple groceries. So there, there are pockets of strength, and there we, we see um, uh, some, some positive activity as well, uh, and. Some of the service offerings where we see a real shift from a client buying perspective, we see strength there as well. And we believe uh, we, we've actually got a good sort of investment there, uh, whether it's cloud or virtualization or, or workforce transformation. <clears throat> and we think uh, those those will be uh, positive. So it's a bit of a mix uh, in terms of the uh, sort of overall view, therefore, on, on cloud change. Got that. And uh, um, it's impressive that uh, you and the entire industry has kind of gotten to this work from home situation in a very short period of time. Uh, how do you see this model evolving for you in the medium to long term? Uh, and how does that kind of tie into some of the longer term uh, cost savings that you could uh, that you, you could get from a model like this? I'll start off and Karim will provide more, more color. Uh, the, the, I think what, what we, we are extremely proud of is this uh, uh, very rapid transition that we've made. Uh, we, we believe uh, with 93%, that's a, a really strong number. And as the London was sharing earlier, uh, that, that's moving north uh, every day. Uh, there, there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure, security, bandwidth, capability uh, that uh, we've we had already put in place, and that we further enhance uh, to make make all of this happen. Uh, in terms of how we see the future evolving, uh, let, let me pass it on to Praveen. Uh, he, he can share with you more color on what we see in, in, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, thanks, Salil. Uh, as Salil mentioned, uh, in a very short span of time, uh, we were able to uh, get about 93% of our people globally uh, work from home uh, in a remote fashion. Uh, so, uh, so from that perspective, uh, I think we have demonstrated uh, uh, resilience and agility in doing it, and the feedback from the clients have been extremely positive. So from a technology perspective, uh, I think now uh, it's proven that we can do this. Obviously, uh, uh, we have to make sure that we invest in infrastructure, we invest in security control, uh, we invest in uh, productivity tools, collaboration tools, and other things. Uh, and uh, one of the positive things is, I mean, if, uh, if you are able to demonstrate uh, good security and good productivity, uh, I'm sure many clients will be much more open to doing this. So that means that uh, in future, uh, some of the things around uh, ODC, air gap ODC, and constraints around that could potentially disappear at least. So it may take some time, but uh, some of those things could disappear. So it will result in uh, probably uh, having much more virtual ODCs rather than any uh, physical ODCs. Uh, so, uh, so and the ability to work remotely also means that uh, it doesn't matter whether you're in India, whether you're in a different part of the world. So it's possible to leverage uh, uh, people capability wherever it exists. And it's also probably possible to start looking at these workers and things like that in a way. So I think fundamentally this uh, new normal will probably, many ideas, I mean, uh, the ideas I'm talking are nothing new, but this uh, uh, this crisis has really enabled uh, some of the acceleration or increase in adoption of some of those stocks. So from that perspective, obviously, uh, there are opportunities for cost takeout. You, may have, you don't have to invest as much in real estate, so travel costs may come down. But you have to invest a lot more in technology, a lot more in security and other things. So net net, uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, it's a very positive thing that has happened. Uh, but whether uh, eventually the new normal means 20% uh, uh, office, 80% go home or whatever, I think that will only take time to tell them. It, again, it can vary from risk perception of the class, risk perception of the industry. Uh, but uh, definitely it will probably be much different than what we have seen today. Sorry, just as a follow-up, could you quantify the cost savings that you will get in the at least in the immediate next quarter from uh, some savings in travel facilities, subcontracting, subcontracting, and other savings you might get because of the reduced activity, and contrast that with what you might lose in terms of utilization and pricing? 
Yeah, so these are trips premature. I think many of these, like I said, will be cost avoidance uh, as well. Uh, there will be some cost optimizing per, per se, which is about, like I said, automation, pyramid, etc. So it will be difficult to give a number where we'll end up on utilization. That will also depend on how demand works out. So, but like I said, you know, we are continuing to make sure that we are taking decisions early, uh, making the non-regret decisions, uh, and of course, monitoring how the uh, overall demand situation, and then take appropriate actions. So, uh, I think I can leave it at that. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. All the best, and I'll come back if there's uh, time to follow. Up. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Edward Ketu from Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Good evening. I was curious if you could differentiate your client's discretionary spending. How much of it is work that what you would have been done, you would have been doing, uh, say, a month or so ago, and how much of it is sort of shifted over to business continuity, help you know move their workforce remote, et cetera. So, has there, has there been a a change in that, and and is that sort of coming to an end? Hi, um, this is Salim. Um, I'm not sure I fully followed the question. I think uh, I'll try and answer it. But if there's something more, please, please uh, ask, ask a follow-up. Um, the, the question was, what was the discretionary a month ago, and, and how, how is it today? Uh, is that, that's the question. We don't normally split up uh, our discretionary project work from our overall revenue. However, uh, of course, uh, some, some of the discretionary work is where we see uh, some slowing in the uh, near term. Is, is that that's what you asked me about? But is there something else? Uh, just, just, you know, I didn't follow the question. I guess I was trying to understand if the makeup of discretionary spend has shifted to more survival work by your clients. And therefore, as, as they settle into this new normal, whether uh, we'll have sort of a drop off after that. So will you get a sort of a continuum of discretionary spending in the short run and then have it fall off uh, after that? Okay. I think uh, for us, not uh, we've not quantified how, how that might play out. We certainly see... Uh, there is some amount of um, that, that sort of work. I wouldn't say survival. It's much more focused on what could be benefits that can be uh, achieved uh, as they want to do, you know, let's say, more virtualization or more move to the cloud. Uh, I don't know if it's discretionary, but it certainly seems in this new environment, uh, what, what would be much more strategic uh, for, for those clients. Uh, and I don't have a sense whether that's going to stay uh, our follow-up. At this stage, uh, we do see there's different, more of a recession playbook uh, and different sets of uh, discussions uh, that I shared earlier that we're having with our clients. And some of that gives us uh, confidence here in the medium term. My, my other question is around H-1B and L-1 visas. Uh, it appears the Trump administration is sort of taking advantage of the current environment and further tightening the ability to uh, get visas and, and move people around. So are you seeing that both from a, uh, an impact on your operations, but also maybe a positive in the sense that as people, other H-1Bs and other firms uh, lose their jobs in the U.S., can you pick those people up to help you meet um, sort of onshore demand? Thank you. On the each uh, one again. again. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Please. Yeah, Khalil, I can take that. Uh, okay, uh, we have. I mean, post COVID, we have not really seen any changes. So whatever changes we have seen in H one, L one, the new lottery system, all those things happened much earlier. It's uh, I don't see any uh, any changes in this uh, regime. Obviously, I mean, even today, as we speak, even for some of our own employees, uh, uh, given that uh, all travel is cut off, uh, some people have uh, been out of status, and uh, 
uh, we are talking to the U.S. administration to make sure that they get some relief and so on. Uh, but uh, in, in the long run, obviously, uh, it's a question of, uh, I mean, uh, if there is a lot of uh, people are letting go and uh, there'll be probably a lot more availability of talent. But whether, uh, uh, whether we will be able to take advantage of it really depends on the nature of demand, right? So it will be a pure function of demand. But from our own perspective, in the last couple of years, uh, our approach has been uh, to de-risk ourselves from H1, L1 thing. And so we have invested, as you're aware, a lot in terms of uh, our U.S. talent strategy. In the last couple of years, we have recruited more than 10,000 U.S. nationals. We have created six hubs. Uh, these hubs uh, in U.S., different parts of the U.S., they are not only delivery hubs, but they also serve as innovation hubs. Uh, so we are, uh, in some sense, uh, we have invested a lot, and today a lot of our people working in U.S. are local nationals. So from that perspective, uh, we are uh, uh, probably less dependent on uh, what happens on the H1, L1 thing. But obviously, I mean, uh, if there is a demand and there is availability of talent, by right talent, we will be always uh, open to pick them up. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Sudhir Guntapalli from Motilalu Sal Financial Services. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, you highlighted in the press briefing that uh, you were winning deals as late as in the last two weeks of March and even in the first two weeks of April. Uh, probably this would be a closer proxy to the expected uh, deal activity over the near term. Uh, in that context, it will be very helpful for us if you can give us uh, some more characteristics of these deals which were won over the last 30 days. Which geographies are they? Which verticals? Which service areas? Is there also any discretionary spending uh, uh, in this? Um, this is Talil. I think uh, what I share is, uh, so we, we want to go ahead. No, I, I can start, and if more is on the call, we can also probably add some color. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned yeah. earlier, uh, we won 12 lot deals. Uh, uh, four of them are, was in retail. Uh, four of them were in uh, energy, utility, resources, and services. And one deal is in financial services, communication, manufacturing, and high tech. Uh, and total TCV was 1.65 billion, and 56% of it was uh, net new. And again, from a geography perspective, seven were from Americas and five uh, were from Europe. So, uh, so as you can see, these deals uh, have been across several industries and geographies as well. Uh, uh, and the fact is, uh, uh, as we mentioned. In the last two to three weeks of the quarter, even after COVID had uh, uh, we were able to close many of these deals. So from that perspective, it was very encouraging for us that uh, we have not seen postponement of at least some of the deals that were in the pipeline. So if Moit is on the call, uh, you can probably provide. Sure. Us. I'm here, Praveen. Uh, so I think uh, Praveen has covered it uh, you know, in fairly great detail. Uh, the only thing I'll add is that uh, you know, we were obviously concerned that the signatures on these deals may get uh, delayed because of the uh, infection. But thankfully, given the relationship and given that we are fairly advanced in the deal, we've been able to push ahead and close. It's a mix of deals uh, across segments and across geographies, and really across service lines as well. So there are cloud deals in this. There are our traditional application maintenance and application development deals. There are intra-services deals for uh, the workspace. And moving ahead as well, obviously, we have an existing uh, portfolio of a pipeline for last week. And we continue to push ahead in this, right? The dialogue with the client are continuing, and uh, we are working to make sure that we don't lose momentum. Sure, sir. So uh, you mean to say that even in the last two weeks, whatever deal activity happened, or even in the first two weeks of April, uh, it's more of a broad-based uh, kind of a deal activity and not uh, characterized towards any one particular segment? That is correct. It's not one single deal. Oh, multiple sure. deals. Sure, sir. And secondly, our exposure to time and material contracts has been comparatively higher uh, at around uh, roughly 47% of our revenue as per our last reporting. The possibility that clients have to ramp down the workloads in these contracts, uh, are we seeing a higher trend or impact in the PNM portion of our portfolio than otherwise? This is Raveen. I can answer. I don't see, I mean, it's early days. I don't see any distinction between PNM or uh, 
domestic price. Obviously, clans are really looking at whether, uh, I mean, in these times, uh, uh, and initially, clans were probably more worried about uh, ensuring business continuity, the safety of their own employees, and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, in these situations, again, uh, conserving cash is a very critical element, and uh, they are obviously they will start looking at projects. Uh, they will start looking at each project, the business case, or the project, whether in the current situation, whether it's priority or not. Uh, I, I think the division will be taken on that basis. Uh, every project will be evaluated for a business case and uh, in, in the new context. And that is the decision they will probably take. I don't think, uh, uh, I mean, TNM or a fixed price on a managed service is more a commercial concern. Sure. And my last question is regarding the on site pyramid. Uh, as you said, we currently have around 10,000 local employees in the US. Uh, even before COVID-19, we were seeing some utilization slash productivity challenges over there, given that we have recently hired these guys and they were going through the ramp-up curve. Now, with the demand expected to take a sharp hit, uh, what is our thought process around managing the utilization of these employees? Uh, some damage control measures which we could have possibly taken in the case of H1B may not be very realistic right now. Uh, so what are your thoughts on how this could be impacting our margin, uh, as in this particular, uh, you know, cost element? Yeah, at this is Sabine again. Uh, okay, uh, so far, I think our utilization on site has been fairly good. It's in line with what we had planned. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, we had also uh, tried to balance into a slightly lower utilization with uh, building a pyramid there, and that had worked out well for us. But in the new context, uh, we have to see, I mean, in the light of demand and other things, obviously, we will go slow on hiring. Uh, in this coming year, in all geographies, uh, we will hire only on a need basis and uh, any incremental hiring will be based on uh, 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 yeah, only from a skill perspective. Uh, we also have opportunities to rotate out up on and uh, replace them with our own people. So there are two levers still available where we can still uh, uh, try to improve the utilization. Uh, again, I mean, uh, we, we have to uh, yeah, evaluate all, can, all options to make sure that our costs are under control. Uh, we, we still have uh, not taken a call on this, and we have to still, I mean, we have to write uh, on how the situation will unfold, and uh, we'll have to take a view, particularly if the utilization drops down dramatically. But uh, we have enough levers, as I said, uh, upfront replacement, a lot of things possible to keep the utilization up. Sure. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. All the best. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Moshe Katri from Wedbush. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, is there any way to kind of differentiate um, in terms of the services that are getting impacted here? And obviously, there's a lot of talk about discretionary that's impacted and non-discretionary that's not impacted. Uh, can you give us color, some color in terms of what's included and in what you call discretionary? And that, is that also including what we call digital uh, in terms of the impact of, uh, in the slowdown? That's my first question. Thanks. Uh, hi, Moshe Salim here. I think in terms of services, um, uh, some, of the, some of the points we sort of discussed earlier, I mean, um, uh, elaborate on those. I think um, we, we definitely see some of our services as related to um, areas around cloud and virtualization actually uh, gaining traction. Uh, we, we will see some other services uh, which relate to uh, some more uh, project level work which is discretionary, which will probably be slower. Uh, overall, uh, we are now getting into uh, looking at how that plays out uh, given the speed at which uh, this is moved. Uh, and we we'll start to develop a sense uh, from all of that into what becomes uh, the focus for Q1 and going ahead. But my sense, uh, again, as I shared earlier, is we, we definitely see the conversations uh, many of us are having with our clients that relate to. Uh, some uh, benefits accruing to us uh, from consolidation, uh, some benefits accruing to us from cloud, uh, some benefits accruing to us from workplace, workplace transformation. Uh, and those are the sorts of services that would be positive. Uh, those areas, virtualization, cloud, uh, work, workplace transformation, uh, all form a part of digital. That's one of the elements of digital uh, that uh, we see some traction. Everything that helps clients uh, to move more, more and more of their work uh, into the remote remote working uh, approach. Uh, there are other elements which uh, potentially which are more project related, uh, which we 
think uh, will become slower in this uh, framework. That's helpful. And then um, my follow-up here, um, there were some questions on pricing. Um, so to frame it the right way, are you seeing any sort of um, effort or effort on behalf of clients to uh, try to restructure contracts at this point? Maybe it's too early to, uh, um, for us to get there, but is there any concern that this is where we're going to get to? And then are you seeing any uh, potential competitors uh, employing any sort of disruptive pricing out there that could impact uh, the industry competitively? Thanks. So on, on the competitors, uh, at this stage, we don't see uh, uh, any any rules. In fact, uh, where we do see some uh, activity uh, is um, what I shared earlier around the uh, vendor consolidation, which is uh, even for some some um, larger competitor competitors of ours, uh, which are not uh, potentially uh, as efficient in their delivery model as we are. Uh, we see some advantages accruing to us there. Uh, in terms of pricing, again, um, in the sector where uh, clients are, or the sector are most impacted, uh, we, we, uh, I'm sure we'll hear about uh, some of these um, discussions. Uh, so we anticipate uh, some of that uh, to happen. But usually, uh, th those discussions are also coupled. Uh, with uh, different uh, delivery models that Praveen was uh, sharing earlier, and also uh, consequent uh, consolidation uh, discussions uh, that come about. So at this stage, we don't have a quantified view on that, but my sense is we'll see some of those discussions start to come up. Thanks for the color. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Padmanabhan from Investec. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking my question. Um, in the uh, last, post the last crisis, actually, we saw, uh, because it started with financial services, we saw a lot of spends around uh, m and integration and, uh, 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 let's say, uh, risk and compliance and so on and so forth. Uh, if you just look out and visualize now, what do you think would be the key uh, uh, areas of spend that people would go out and do uh, once there is some sort of recovery? So it broke up a little bit, but I think you were saying M&A spend? Was that the question? No, no. Well, what I was referring to was um, uh, in, during post-GFC, uh, we actually saw uh, a lot of spend uh, during the recovery phase come in terms of merger and integration spends of those banks and risk and compliance-related spends. So when you visualize a recovery this time around, uh, which areas do you see really coming out in a big way. My sense is even through the, this period, but especially as, as things come back uh, to a different uh, new normal, the, the spend on digital will continue to accelerate. There's different components of it which which are active. Uh, as I shared earlier, you see some of that already going through it, uh, and especially the focus around the broader uh, cloud discussion. But the, the big, bigger moves on digital will, will absolutely uh, come back at that point. Uh, in addition, there will be um, a transformation initiative, uh, which uh, we, we will see more and more of my sense uh, as, in, as in when um, we see uh, that, that sort of uh, uh, recovery phase starting to come back in. Uh, sure. And as a follow-up to that, um, you know, so if you see the uh, recovery phase last time, um, we saw a lot of these services that were built over the previous 10 years sort of go through a commoditization. Um, now this time around, if you look at uh, digital, I think it's now a reasonable part of portfolios of most vendors. Do you, do you envision some sort of a commoditization there in some form? Or do you think that uh, because there'll be far more transformation projects and so on and so forth, you'll actually see a shift to larger vendors from uh, smaller vendors? How, how would you visualize uh, the changes this time around? So the commoditization is more, more difficult uh, for me to comment today. Uh, we have to sort of wait and see uh, 
uh, in part, you know, how, how, how the demand supply looks. Uh, at, at. Uh, in terms of movement, uh, it's very clear already uh, to us that there's a movement from uh, the smaller or the less capable vendors to larger or the more capable vendors. Uh, and, and we definitely see with Hathcan, uh, we, we, um, we, we believe we'll benefit from that. Sure, thank you so much and uh, all the best. The next question is from the line from line of uh, Brian Bergen from Coven. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. I wanted to ask a clarification on the remote capability for the first quarter. Do you still have supply constraints that will limit your 1Q revenue potential, or is it all demand-driven going forward? I'll start off and try to add if I, if I missed something. Uh, we still have uh, some supply constraints which we're working through. Uh, we we uh, have internally the target to uh, get to essentially what we call 100% um, uh, 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 capability. There, we have all of our clients in the ship. Uh, so, really, it's going to add something. Yeah. Uh, see, if you look at uh, the remaining 7%. A very small percentage or areas where the uh, uh, clients have not given us permission to operate from work from home. It's a very small percentage. So in the context of a lockdown or an extended lockdown, uh, then uh, we will uh, continue to be challenged from a supply perspective uh, because uh, we will not be able to get people to come to office and work. That's one percentage. Then we also have in a lockdown situation some percentage of people who have gone home who are not in our locations and they don't have any personal assets or com company assets with them. So they are also stranded. So I think only during the period of lockdown uh, we would anticipate some kind of supply issues. But uh, once the lockdown gets relaxed, we should be able to get people back to office and equip them either with assets or wherever clients uh, have not given permission, they should be able to uh, come and work in offices. Yeah, I just want to add that when you're looking at 97%, 93, uh, if you know on-site, most of it is nearly 100%. So on-site, as you know, our billing rates, etc., are much, much higher. So 97%, 93% doesn't mean that we're losing 7% of revenue due to supply. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, the large deal signings you've had in late March and early April, for the new deals that you close, are those projects ramping up and starting on a normal time frame, or are any of those delayed? In fact, uh, I'll make one comment on that, and then uh, maybe the more can also add to it. We, we had um, one of our largest uh, uh, projects ramping up uh, in, in literally the middle of all of this activity, uh, late March, uh, early April, the European uh, project. And, and we saw how through all of this remote working, we could manage to ramp, ramp that up uh, extremely successfully and on schedule. Uh, so that's one of the positives that we've seen. Uh, but uh, for more color on, on the specific deals there, uh, probably if you want to have something, uh, and then the way to I think, uh, I mean, you explained, so in, uh, the challenges initially would have been only around transition and uh, ramp up, but in the deal with Salil mentioned, uh, we, in fact, had rebadging, and we were able to get a significant number of land people uh, on print service roles. We were able to do onboarding on a remote manner. Similarly, with other plant in U.S., again, uh, we were just about to start the project uh, when this uh, COVID situation and lockdown happened. But we were able to use tools and other things and start working on a remote transition plan. So we had a couple of – we had a few days where we had to rework uh, our plans on things. So uh, there are few examples like this which has given us confidence and comfort that even in situations like this, uh, uh, using uh, technology and uh, collaboration tools, we should be able to do the transition. So from that perspective, uh, uh, I, I, I mean, going forward, I don't see uh, too much of a challenge in terms of ramp up unless plans want to slow down on some of the ramp up in the current situation. Moit, anything to add? Okay. No, I think that was uh, helpful. Uh, we're trying to ramp up where we can. And in many cases, we have uh, seen uh, even the remote ramp ups happen or remote transition, remote KT happen. So that is obviously a positive thing for us. Now, there will be instances where 
uh, remote transmission is not possible in the situation of a complete lockdown and you might need some percentage of people to be at the client location. Those might get slightly delayed, but on the whole, we are not seeing any of these programs sort of being structurally delayed because clients are now walking back their commitments. Okay. If I could squeeze one more in here, you, you mentioned vendor consolidation conversations that you're having with clients. In what industries is that occurring? I'll start with that, and, and many of our leadership have had that uh, sort of discussion. Uh, we've had that, at least I've had those discussions across multiple sectors, so it's not uh, specific at this stage uh, to your uh, sector. Uh, there have been areas where it's related more to uh, their client to uh, uh, some small vendors potentially having uh, challenges as they went to remote working, uh, challenges uh, on um, uh, financial stability in the medium uh, to long term. Uh, in other cases, we've seen this with uh, large um, clients where they, they want to make sure that the uh, benefits of automation uh, are more, more sort of streamlined uh, into their work. So it's not specific to uh, uh, at least any industry uh, in the discussions I have had and our leadership have had. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to the management for their closing comments. Over to you, sir. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us on this call. We look forward to continuing our conversation over the course of the quarter. Thanks and have a good day. Thank you very much, members of the management. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of NCU, that concludes this conference call. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your line. Playback is complete.